today. Lord, I thank you that your name is above every name, Lord God. Amen. We thank you, Lord God, for those that you healed, for those that you are healing, for those that you will yet heal. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for the light of life. Thank you that he is the resurrection. <laughs> he is the resurrection and the life, the life, the life, the life, Lord God. Thank you that the life, Lord God, is from you, Lord God. The air that we breathe is from you, God. We glorify your name. We honor you, Lord God. We want to lift you up and praise you for who you are. Lord, you are wonderful. You are counselor. You are the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Thank you that you are Jesus, the door to heaven. Lord, thank you that you are the way maker. Thank you that you are the chain breaker, Lord God. Hallelujah, Lord God. Our lives, our destinies are in your hands. And Father, I thank you that you are breathing destiny today in people's lives. Lord God, I thank you that you are breathing life. Lord God, it's your dead carcasses right now in the name of Jesus. We are believing, Lord God, that you are speaking to the dry bones. And you said, Son of man, prophesy unto the dry bones. And Lord, we pray right now we speak, Lord God, the prophetic word into the people's lives that they would come alive right now. Awaken in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Lord, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord God. We hear the rattling of bones, Lord God. We hear a great army coming together, Lord God. Across America, Father, we thank you that you are reinstituting your laws and your ways. Thank you for your government, Lord God. Take over, Lord God. Take over the service again and again and again. We yield our bodies as living sacrifices unto you, Lord God. We ask you, we surrender, we surrender right now, Father. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. Have your way. Oh God, so Lord God, take control. Lord God, we're praying that you would please right the wrongs right now for people that are going through the wrongs right now. That you would please reverse it as you did in the book of Malachi. Lord God, as you did in the book of Esther, Lord God, the Mordecai. Lord God, we reverse it. Yes. Father, we're praying. Yes. That you would reverse things for people right now that are going through problems, that are going through struggles, Lord God, right now, by the touch of your glorious hand, that you would breathe, that you would breathe, Lord God, that you would breathe, Lord God. We are praying for your breath of life to flow into this place right now. Give life, Lord God, to those that are dead in the name of Jesus, and our family members, friends, those that are wayward, Lord God, those that are running away from you right now. Lord, we know they can only run so far. Lord God, you're going to catch them. You have a big fish waiting in the sea, Lord God. Father, we just thank you that you are going to draw them back. Yes, you are. In the name of Yeshua, Father God, in the name of Yeshua, Yeshua, Hamashiach. Lord God, we thank you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We give you praise. Blessed be the name of the Lord.
rain sweeps in our lives. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, for the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord God. The Holy Spirit have your way. Breathe, breathe of us. Breathe in this place. Yes, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can you all stand with me, please? Hallelujah. Seriously, why, why do people 
Amen. Amen. Oh, Jesus. Listen, I've done some things and I've been around some places. Never in all of my life have I ever, ever experienced a joy and a love and a peace like the one that Jesus gives. Amen. 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 If you are seeking for something and you're just not satisfied, I beg you, try Jesus. Amen. Leave it at the altar and let God have it all. He will change your life. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Whew. I'm just going. Uh, yeah. All right. Here's the question. Who am I? I'm going to give you some clues, and you try to figure out who it is that I'm talking about. Ready, kids? Boy, all the kids, raise your hand. And all the teens, raise your hand. Hey, man. We are teens at heart. Kids at heart. He is considered the most brilliant American of his time, yet rarely saw the inside of a classroom. He spent two years attending Boston Latin School in a private academy before joining the family candle and soap business. Number two, by age 12, he was serving as an apprentice at a print shop owned by his brother James. He made up for his lack of education by spending what little money he had on books. He would buy those books, read them, he would get essays, and then he would rewrite the essays from memory. Wow. He arrived in Philadelphia in 1723. There's another hint, practically penniless. But over the next two decades, became incredibly wealthy as a print phone shopper and as a publisher of Poor Richard's Almanac. Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin. Praise God. Wow. I didn't even know that. More facts on him. By 1748, the 42-year-old Benjamin Franklin was rich enough to hang up his printer's apron and became a gentleman of leisure. By 1785, he was the richest man in America. Wow. Despite never running for elected office, he served as a delegate for the Continental Congress and the Constitutional Convention was a diplomat and ambassador to France and Sweden, the first postmaster general and the president of the Supreme Executive Council of Pennsylvania. He was one of our founding fathers, the oldest to sign the Declaration of Independence. He said this, quote, whoever would overthrow the liberty of a nation must begin by subduing the freeness of speech, our First Amendment right, freeness of speech. If somebody wants to overthrow the nation, that's where they begin. Wow. You guessed it already. He's on the $100 bill. By the way, he was the first man, from what I understand, to print money in the United States of America, which is incredible. Yes, and the lightning rod, that's right. Created so many inventions. He was also the one to say, early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. And he also had another slogan, which he lived by. He said, do you love life? Then do not squander time. For that's the stuff life is made of. Do you love life? Then do not squander time. Went back and did a little research about Benjamin Franklin and saw his daily routine. He actually wrote it down. And he wrote it down from 5 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. And he had segments that were parted. Part was going to be four hours of working, another four hours of work, uh, and then it was going to be two hours of leisure. But the, the thing that amazed me is what he did right in the morning. First thing every single morning, it says that he rose, he washed, and he addressed powerful goodness. In other words, he spent time in prayer with God. And then after that, he would ask himself, listen to this, what good shall I do today? He would ask himself this every single day. What good shall I do today? Before he went to bed at night at 10 o'clock, he asked himself the question, what good have I done today? In the morning, what good can I do? At night, what good have I done? Wow. 
In other words, Benjamin Franklin woke with intention. He had purpose. Every day when he woke up, he woke up with a purpose in mind, with an intention in mind. He didn't just wake up and say, oh, it's just another day. He woke up and said, there's something for me to do. There is an assignment for me to accomplish. There is something that Providence has for me to do, and I have to accomplish that mission.
God has given each of us 24 hours, and I don't know how many minutes we went through this once before in time management. You can go check out that message. But God wants us to make use. But then people get so scared. They say, how? How, Pastor John? How do I make use of my time? How do I redeem that time? I want to give you five ways to plan each day. Ready? Somebody said this, the key is not to prioritize what's on your schedule, but to schedule your priorities. Wow. Can I read that again? Yeah. The key is not to prioritize what's on your schedule. The key is to schedule your priorities. Yeah. What do you value most? What do you think God values most? As Christians walking in the power of Jesus Christ, you're saying, I'm a Christian, I'm following after the Lord. What is your priority? What do you think God's top priorities are? Those are the things that we must value. Those are the things that we must put on the schedule. Other things must be put aside and come under our priorities. Right. Our godly priorities. Amen. According to American historian David Borden, Franklin was the least religious person among the founding fathers. <laughs> Out of the 250, I believe it was, he was the least religious. Somebody say least. 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 He was considered the least religious, but he had one priority. That was very valuable to him. You know what it was? Time and prayer. Remember? He would wake up in the morning and he would address goodness. He would pray to the Father. After weeks at the Continental Convention, realizing each state came with their own agenda. All these states are coming together as the state of America is getting put together to be a United States. They're each coming with their own agenda. New Jersey's coming. Virginia's coming. Everybody's coming with their own agenda to that meeting. And after five weeks, Franklin got very upset. And the 81-year-old got up and he gave a speech, the longest he had ever given. I'm going to share this. The least religious person. Gentlemen, in this situation of the assembly groping as it were in the dark to find political truth and scarcely able to distinguish it when presented to us, how has it happened, sirs, that we have hitherto once thought of humbly appealing to the Father of Lights. Have not hitherto once thought of humbly appealing to the Father of Lights to illuminate understanding. Do you get it? After five weeks, they're going through all this stuff. This 81-year-old, the least religious among the fathers, the forefathers, he says, listen guys, how is it that in these five weeks we have all this delegation, we've had all of this talking, all this bickering, but not once have we appealed to God, who is the Father of lights, to get illumination on what we should do. Listen to what he says. This is one of our forefathers. Somebody say, forefathers. In the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayer in this room. 11 years before, they had signed the Declaration of Independence, and in that room, they had daily prayer. This is our founding fathers who prayed daily for understanding, daily to understand the heart and the mind of God. He says, we prayed daily in this room for divine protection. Our prayers were heard, Hallelujah. and they were graciously answered. Amen. All of us engaged in the struggle, in the struggle, and must have observed frequent instances of superintending providence in our favor. In other words, all those times that we were, we were praying, we saw God's favor over and over. We saw God answer us over and over again. And how have we now forgotten this powerful friend? Or do we imagine no longer that we don't no longer need his assistance? I have lived service a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs the affairs of men. Amen. If a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured in the sacred writings. Another thing our founding fathers did, they read the scriptures. Incredible, isn't it? The news that we're hearing today, all the reports that we're hearing, the things that we're wanting to do is brush away our history. We're trying to push it away. You know what they're trying to push away? They're trying to push out God. They're trying to push the, the scriptures out. They're trying to push out the reality of how we really started as a nation. If a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, he is quoting Jesus. 
Is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured in the sacred script, scriptures and writings that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this. I, the least religious one. <laughs> I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of battle, and we shall become a reproach and a byword down to future ages. I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessing on our deliberations be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business. End quote. End quote. Our founding fathers. Our founding fathers believed in prayer. It was a priority for them. For them. In the early days, they would gather together in that room and they would kneel before the Lord God and they would intercede and they would pray and they would fast and they would ask God to come down and help them. We are not seeing so much of that today. But that's the way it was. That's reality. That's the truth. I don't care who's out there. All you have to do is pick up a book from history and just do a little reading and you'll find out exactly the way we were raised. But Franklin believed in prayer. He believed it was a priority and we should pray also. We talked about prayer a few weeks ago. We also talked about studying the Word, but I can't overemphasize the need to study the Word, especially in these days. Redeem the time for the days are evil. How are you going to know the difference between good and evil if you don't read the Word of God and understand God's perspective? How are you going to understand what when something is right and when something is wrong if you don't have God's position on it? Amen? Amen. And the only way to get God's position on it is to read the Scriptures daily. There was an interview done with the late Billy Graham, and he talked about the three regrets that he had. And he said, although I have much to be grateful for, as I look back over my life, I also have many regrets. I have failed many times, and I would do many things differently. For one thing, listen, I would speak less and study more. Yeah. Fine. Good idea. This is America's evangelist. And he's saying, basically, I would speak less and study more. Wow. Now, Billy Graham needed to get into the scriptures more. How about you and me? Wow. Yeah. There's some Christians that won't even crack open the Bible. They won't even get into the Word of God. How can you do that as a Christian? How can you avoid the Word of God? Go back to last week's message and listen to the importance of the need for studying the Word of God. If you want to redeem the time, you have to spend time with the God who created the dead. You have to understand exactly what He's got for your life. And listen, this is why Jesus gave us the, the model prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We need to pray, amen? And listen, if you have no prayer, just say, Lord, order the next steps according to your word. You want to be aligned to God's plan. If he's already got a plan for you that day, you want to say, Lord, show me the plan that you have. And if I, you don't know it, just say, Lord, order my steps according to your word. Take control, Lord God. And I'll just follow wherever you go. So, study the word of God as well if you want to redeem time. Just like Billy Graham said, he'd study more. Amen. Third is savor the time. Late internationally known art critic Bernard Berenson had a zest for life, and shortly before he died at 94 years old, he told a friend, quote, I wish I could stand on a busy corner, hat in hand, begging people to throw me all their wasted hours. Can I just say that again? I wish I could stand on a busy corner, hat in hand, begging people to throw me all their wasted hours. Isn't that a shame that at 94, he realizes the need to value every single day? The Apostle James says that life is like a vapor. It's here for one moment and it's gone for the next. You never know what a day holds. I shared this once before and I'll share it again. We received a phone call out of the blue. My little nephew, 16-year-old John Babbitt, gone. He was on a basketball court, collapsed. Nobody could revive him. 16 years old. He had life ahead of him. A week before that, I was driving into school, and I said, John, what do you think you want to do? Wow. What do you think you want to do as you get ready for college? Where do you want to go? He said, Uncle John, I want to help people. Then you get this phone call. I couldn't even tell my wife. I couldn't even get the nerve to tell my wife. But when I did tell her, she collapsed. She fainted. Who would ever dream? 
This young man played lacrosse. He played baseball, basketball. He was so fit. He was at the gym. I used to drive him, pump it on her. He was so fit. Figured this kid's going to outlive everybody. He's going to be like 95 years old. He's going to still keep going. 16 years old. Passed away. And we went to the hospital. And I kneeled by his corpse. I'm thinking, what, what is this? And I looked into his eyes. He was still on 16 years old. None of us knows what tomorrow holds. Only the one who holds tomorrow. Amen. None of us knows what's going to happen in the next few minutes, the next hour, the next day. We have to savor the time that God has given us. Our times are in his hands. Job chapter 14, verse 5. Job said, listen, all of my days are in your hands, and you know the exact time that I'm going to die, and I'm not given one minute further. Amen. We have to savor the day. You want to wake up and redeem the time, and you have to wake up. What good can I do today? Lord, what can I do? Father, I'm praying to you. Order my steps according to your word. Let your kingdom come. I want to follow in your path. I need your plan in my life. I'm going to walk in the path that you have ordained for me already since you already designed it in past eternity. Study the word to get a word from God. Savor the time. Be sensitive, number four, to the Holy Spirit. Be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Listen, if you're um, praying, if you're seeking the word, you're going to be on high alert. The Spirit's going to have you on high alert. You're going to be sensitive to your surroundings, to the people around you, your workplace, your school. I don't care where you are. When you're following the Holy Spirit of God, you are being sensitive. You could be doing something and suddenly God says, turn around. And you feel prompted to do something that's completely out of your day. Yeah. Right? There's a gentleman in the New Testament named Philip. And Philip was just living his life as usual, a follower of Jesus Christ. And he was just doing his daily routine. Then suddenly, the Bible says this, that he was to run next to a chariot. The Spirit of God says, go and attach yourself to this chariot. And when he gets there, he finds that there's a man who is reading the book of Isaiah. See, God will set it up. He's a God who sets things up. This is what I love about God. You, you don't know what's happening, but God's setting everything up already. You just have to listen to the Holy Spirit, because if you don't listen to the Holy Spirit, you won't see the final outcome, but you got to listen to the Lord. Sometimes you'll be in a grocery store, and God will tell you, stop, turn around, talk to this individual. Suddenly, as you begin to talk to them, they say, my, my, my loved one just passed away. I, I, I don't know what to do. All of a sudden, there's a door of opportunity now that you can pray, that you can say, here's my number. Listen, I can help you out. We're here. We're a church. Whatever it is. But God can open up that door of opportunity for you, but you need to be sensitive. Then Philip ran to the chariot and said and heard the man reading. And the impact, what happened to this man? This man then has the scriptures expounded to him by Philip. Philip begins to explain who Jesus is out of the scriptures. And this man gets saved. He's baptized. And after that, Philip is gone. The Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord just took him out of there. But you can have an impact. What good are you going to do today? What kind of impact are you going to have? Are you just wasting, squandering the time, or are you using every second, every minute so that it counts for the kingdom of God and for the glory of God? Glory. Don't let, number five, yesterday's failure stop you from moving forward. Jesus. Alexander Graham Bell said this. He said, when one door closes, another one opens, but we often look so long and so regretfully upon the closed door that we do not see the one that is open for us. Can I say that again? One more. There we go. When one door closes, another opens, but we often look so long and so regretfully upon the closed door that we do not see the one that has opened for us there. Abraham Lincoln. You know him? Yes. Can I just read some facts about him? Yes. Yes. 1831, as a lawyer, lost his job. 1832, defeated for state legislator. 1833, failed in business. 1835, endured having to go through his sweetheart dying. 1836, had a nervous breakdown. 1838, defeated and run for Illinois State Speaker. 1843, defeated and run for governor. <laughs> oh, 
1848, defeated and run for Congress. 1849, rejected and paid for land officer. 1854, defeated and run for the U.S. Senate. 1856, defeated for nomination to vice president. 1858, defeated and run for U.S. Senate. 1860, elected president of the United States of America. Hallelujah. He didn't give up. He didn't give up. He knew there's something in my life, there's something of value that God has for me, and he kept pressing forward. Hallelujah. Don't give up. Amen. If you leave here with anything today, don't give up on your life. Don't give up on the things of the past, failures, whatever it is. God has something in store for you. Do not give up. Keep pressing forward. Keep moving forward. Amen. 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 Max Lucado said this. I will be grateful for 24 hours that are before me. Time is a precious commodity. I refuse to allow what little time I have to be contaminated by self-pity, anxiety, or boredom. I will face this day with, joy, with the joy of a child and with the courage of a giant. While it is here, I will use it for loving and giving. Today, I will make a difference. I will not, not let past failures haunt me. Even though my life is scarred with mistakes, I refuse to rummage through my trash heap of failures. I will admit them. I will correct them. I will press on victoriously. No failure is fatal. It's okay to stumble. I will get up. It's okay to fail. I will rise again today. I am going to make a difference. difference. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 I am going to make a difference today. Amen. You cannot allow the failures of yesterday to determine what you're going to do today. God's mercies are new every single Thank morning. Every day that you wake up, God is pressing the reset button. He said, let's do it again. Let's do it again. You messed up yesterday, no problem. Let's do it again. Amen. Let's try something Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 The Apostle Paul said, forgetting what is behind and embracing what is ahead he said, I press on. But some of you may be saying, Pastor John, it's really too late. I really have squandered so much time. There's no possible way that I can get all this time back. There's no way that I can ever recover from this. But you know, God is the timeless one. There is no time with God. There's time in this world. We serve a God who is eternal. Yes. And if our life and our times are in His hand, guess what? He can buy back or use or come up with time if He needs to. I don't know if you heard this story, but years ago, Joshua was in a battle and, and all of a sudden as he was fighting, the Bible says that and the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation of Israel took vengeance on their enemies. You see, this is the God that we serve. We serve a God who can stop the sun. We serve a God who can stop time. We have a God who can redeem time. He is the same God that said, listen, hallelujah, I will restore or replace the years that the canker worm has eaten. I will restore, not the minutes, not the hours, but the years, the squandered years, the years that were eaten up, the years you think you'll never get back. God says, I can restore that in an instant, in a second. That's the kind of God that I am. I can redeem the time because when Paul says redeem the time for the days of evil, the word redeem means to buy back again. Hallelujah. God is the only one who can purchase so you're not a failure. No, we're not. Amen. And you've got hope because you've got a God who can redeem time. He says, he goes to his own bank. I want to take out, uh, give me 15 years for John Trudeau. Amen. Isn't that what he did with Hezekiah? Hezekiah had his head turned against the wall. He was ready to die. Mm -hmm. And God said, Hezekiah prayed, Lord, have mercy on me. Remember me. God spoke to the prophet Isaiah, go back to my servant. Go back to him and tell him I'm adding 15, 15 years. Come on. Amen. Our God can do anything. Yes, can. Amen. Yes, it's can. never, ever, ever yes, too late. Can I just share one story that I love? Samson. It's this guy, Samson. I love Samson. There's something about Samson. I just can relate to this dude. You know? 
Samson was anointed, he was blessed, he had a call in his life, but yet Samson faltered so many times. He'd be up and then he'd be down. He'd be fighting the Philistines and there'd be a great victory, and then all of a sudden you find him in a you know, brothel somewhere away from Israel. He's hooking up with other women, he's doing all this stuff, and then he comes back and, hey, Dad, I'm sorry, I messed up. <laughs> And then he gets right with God again, and then all of a sudden, boom, he's on fire. He takes a drop on and he kills. I don't have any thousands. And then he goes back. You're not supposed to drink wine. Let me just have a little bit. He drinks out. He messes up. Yeah. Then comes the sweetheart of his life. Delilah. <laughs> Young men, stay away from Delilah. <laughs> Young men. Young women stay away from a man version of Delilah. <laughs> Delilah comes in, oh Samson, tell me where you get your great strength. I'm not telling you. Please, that means you don't love me, honey. Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. Snip. He's ready, guys. He's coming together. They got him. The Philistines, he wasn't able to break free anymore. His great strength was gone, the anointing was gone. In one of the scariest verses of the Bible, it says there, Samson did not understand that the Spirit of God left him. That, that's scary to me. Samson didn't realize that the Spirit of God departed from him. Wist not, the King James says, wist not that the Spirit of the Lord had departed from him. They captured him. And let me tell you something, there's always a consequence to sin. Always. You can't, you can't get away from sin. You can, you can live a Christian life, and you can go to bars, and you can do all this kind of stuff, but it's going to catch up to you at one point. Like, number says your sin, you know, it will come back to haunt you. Samson was captured, and he was brought into this great arena, and he was placed there between two falls. They actually gouged out his eyes. And the Bible says that they came there, and they mocked him. And they made fun of him. Judges chapter 16, verse 20 says, Now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. About 3,000 men and women were on the roof watching Samson entertain them. Now he was just being used for entertaining purposes. This was the man that was coming and really causing such damage to the Philistine armies. Just one man. Now they were, they were gleeful because now they, they captured this man, they gouged his eyes out, he's got no strength, they put him between two pillars, and he's standing there, and can you imagine? Can you imagine him saying, Lord, I messed up? Can you imagine the prayers that are going on in his head? Oh man, I didn't redeem the time, I squandered my time, I didn't use my days right, God of Israel, have mercy on me, I'm so sorry. And the Bible says that he did, he said a prayer. A small prayer. And he said, The sovereign Lord, remember me again. Oh God, please strengthen me just one more time. <laughs> With one blow, let me pay back the Philistines for the loss of my two eyes. You know what he was praying? God, forgive me. I messed up. I, I really lost control. Help me, Lord. Redeem my time, my purpose in life. Whatever you have destined me to do, whatever you called me to do, <laughs> whatever you called me to do, God, I'm right here and I'm ready. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Now I want you to notice something, that in this place it says all the lords, all the women, all the men, some are on top, some are on the bottom, some are witnessing from the, the plateau on top, all of them were in this arena. <laughs> you see, it's a set. Turn to somebody and say, it's a set. It's a setup. Why is it a setup? Listen to what it says. Verse 29 and 30 of Judges chapter 16. Samson took hold of the two middle pillars that supported the temple and he leaned. <laughs> he leaned against them with his right hand on one and his left hand on the other. Then Samson said, let me die with the Philistine, and he pushed with all his might, and those pillars broke, and they were the pillars holding up much of what was upstairs and on the bottom, and he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell 
on the lords and all the people who were in it, so that the dead that he killed in his death were more than he killed in his entire life. God is able to help you redeem the wow. time. He's got a purpose for your life. And even when you mess up, God says, I'm still going to use you. You are still going to be effective. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. What I've called you to do, I'm going to call you back and do what I've called you to do. I'm going to help you to do. I'm going to assist you. I am the God who redeems your days and your times. Amen. 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 Think about this. Samson go, I'm a loser. There's no way. God, please just remember me one more time. Help me to fulfill your mission. Now, I know this is kind of gory. You know, he's killing people. But I'm just talking about in the spiritual sense, you are able to defeat your enemy, the devil, and you're able to go forward. And in one day, you could do more damage to the kingdom of darkness and hell than you can in a whole lifetime. Amen. Not only it's a Amen. of God. Because your God is able to redeem the time. He's able to buy it back, and he's able to give you minutes. He's able to give you life. He's able to restore the wasted years. He's able to do anything. Yes. Amen. Anything at all. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. I will restore the years of the canker worm. I'll restore your life. Let's bow our heads. Father, we just thank you that you are the God of the impossible. Yes. That you are the God who can do exceedingly and abundantly above and beyond all that we could ask or think. And Father, right now, I know, I know in my heart of hearts that there's people, there are people out there who have wasted their days, wasted their time. And Lord, many think it's a failure that they can't go on. But Lord God, you are the God who can redeem by that time. And Lord God, you can give us as much time as we need. Lord, you're able to stop the sun. You're able to... Stop the moon and the stars. You're able to stop anything you want, Father God. You're able to add, like you did with Hezekiah, 14 years. You're able to do anything. And Father, now I'm just speaking to hearts who don't know you. Lord, you're the timekeeper of their lives as well, and you've given them ample time to turn, to repent, to say they're sorry, to surrender their lives to you. Lord, we don't know what tomorrow holds. Just like I had no idea, Carol had no idea, Dave and Joy had no idea. Andrew had no idea. And John Taylor back. Who's going to leave in an instant, Lord? He was perfectly healthy, Lord. Perfect. No drugs. Just happened to be this rare, rare, rare condition of a heart that he had. No trouble. surrender his life to you. Thank you that he did commit himself to you. Thank you that he said yes to Jesus. And thank you that he asked Jesus to come into his heart. Lord, we'll never forget the day that he prayed that prayer. And Lord, we thank you so much for allowing him to make it into heaven. But Father, there's others here today that are on the wrong side of the tracks, that are on the wrong road, Father God. They are leading a life that is not worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, one that is actually bringing harm to them. Community of Christ. The Lord, worst of all, is hurting your heart. Your heart is broken. Your heart is broken. You cry and you weep over these souls. So, Lord, we pray, bring them in right now. Convict them by your Holy Spirit. Convince them that they need to put their lives into your hands. I'm going to pray a prayer right now. I'm going to ask everybody in this room, everyone, please, in this room, to say it out loud. But especially you who are either watching or in this room who need Jesus Christ, who want to ask Jesus to be Lord of the Lords in your life, to pray this prayer out loud with me as well. Say, Heavenly Father, I have sinned against you, and I'm so sorry. I'm sorry for breaking your law.
that he's my ruler. And if I believe in my heart that he is alive, raised from the dead, if I call on the name of the Lord, I will be safe. So right now, Jesus, I call on you. Save me. Wash me. Cleanse me. Make me a brand new creature. By the power of your Holy Spirit, I give it all to you. Father, I thank you for those that have prayed this prayer. Lord God, I pray that they would continue to seek your face, Lord God, and that you would continue to reveal yourself to them and open up the pathways of life for the plan and the destinies that you have for them. For all that are here today, Father God, I don't care if you're 7 or if you're 70 or 8 or 80 or 9 or 90, God has a plan for you and a destiny that will be fulfilled in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody say, I receive that. In Jesus' name. Rock on that peace. Thank you, Father. We praise you and we bless you. Lord God, we bless your name. And the Lord bless you. And the Lord keep you. And the Lord make his face to shine upon you. And the Lord be gracious unto you. Lift up his countenance on you. And the Lord grant you.